We are ready to wrap up what we started with Stormlight September by talking about the fourth book in the Stormlight Archive. So baby steps, guys, or as some would say, journey before destination, you bastard. No one ever accomplished anything by being content with who they were. We accomplish great things by reaching toward who we could become. As long as it's what you want to become, not what someone else thinks you should become. Heroism is a myth you tell idealistic young people, specifically when you want them to go and bleed for you. Extinction is the natural escalation of war. If you forget why you are fighting, then victory itself becomes the goal. No army, no matter how clean its reputation, walked away from war untainted. And no leader, no matter how noble, could help but sink when he stepped into the game of conquest. Some people charged towards the goal, running for all they had. But it wasn't the speed that mattered. It was the direction that they were going. Our weakness doesn't make us weak. Our weakness makes us strong. For we've had to carry it all of these years. This is life, and I will not lie by saying every day will be sunshine. But there will be sunshine again, and that is a very different thing to say. That is truth. When the darkness is strong, you need someone to remind you that the world hasn't always been this way, that it won't always be this way. His entire life had been a futile effort to stop a storm by yelling at it. The storm simply did not care. Hey, what's up, bookworms and Stormbless Mike? Back to talk a little Stormlight Archive, and today we're going to be diving into the fourth book in that series. That is, of course, Rhythm of War by Lord Ruler Brandon Sanderson, a book that it seems like since I started this channel, we have been waiting for. And now that it's here, uh, I've done plenty of talking about it. Uh, look, guys, this is going to be my standard non-spoiler review. So if you're looking for a deep dive into this book, I've done five videos talking about each section of this book. Full spoilers, over two hours worth of spoiler talk. This is more for people who haven't read it yet and want to kind of know, hey, what'd you think about it? That's just what my standard reviews are. So a little out of order this time. Usually I would do spoiler talk after I do a standard review, but I wanted to kind of do it as I was reading along with it. I thought that was the, that was what people seem to be the most interested in. So uh, look, yes, this will be a review for Rhythm of War. There will be no spoilers for Rhythm of War. However... I have to talk about things that happened in the first three books to uh, kind of get to where we are in here. So if you haven't read at least the first three books, I'd probably, you know, go check out those reviews, maybe bookmark this one, come back. This is the fourth book in the series. It's basically the penultimate story to the first half because he wants to do two five book arcs. So this is the setup to where we've been leading to and what we're going to conclude here probably 2023 if he keeps his same schedule here. But, you know, I don't like to think about it in terms like that because you'll get depressed thinking about how long we got to wait for these books. But uh, yes, book four, uh, very, very anticipated. So guys, let's just jump right into it. Let's talk about what is it about here? Now, after forming a coalition of human resistance against the enemy invasion, Dalinar Kolin and his Knights Radiant have spent a year fighting a protracted, brutal war. Now, neither side has gained an advantage, and the threat of betrayal by Dalinar's crafty ally, Taravangian, looms over every strategic move. But now, as technological discoveries by Novani Kolin scholars begin to change the face of the war, the enemy prepares a bold and dangerous operation, an arms race that follows will challenge the very core of radiant ideals and potentially reveal the secrets of the ancient tower that was once the heart of their strength. Now at the same time, Kaladin Stormblast must come to grips with his changing role within the Knights Radiant. His Windrunners face their own problem. As more deadly enemy fused awaken to wage war, no more honor sprint are willing to bond with humans to increase the number of radiants. Now Adolin and Shallan must lead a coalition envoy 
to the honor sprint stronghold of lasting integrity and either convince the sprint to join the cause against the evil god odium or personally face the storm of failure and guys that sets the stage for rhythm of war obviously you have war in the title uh, you know that there's gonna be a little bit of a little fisticuffs in a story like this but guys let's just jump right into it what makes it good or bad i like to start with the good first and as always sanderson remains the master of expanding this world that he's created. We learn more about your Thiru in this one. We learn so much more about uh, Singer and the Fuse culture. All kinds of things that just continue to increase this world, but he also continues to increase the greater Cosmere, which I won't spoil for you, but just know that there are a lot of things there to unpack. So if you're looking for him just to continue to do that Robert Jordan-esque kind of world building, he does it here in spades. There is large portions of this book that just continue to just build upon what he's already done in the first three books. And uh, it's just one of those things that you're just like, I don't know how much bigger he can make this, but he continues to exceed expectations on that just like he does on his character development. His character development remains top notch. There is uh, side characters that you wouldn't consider uh, that he would have actually talked about as much in this book as he does. He does that great as always, but he does continue to develop the big main players here. I feel like Shalon and Navani get very big arcs in this book, and they are full arcs. Uh, I've said in the past that I felt like Navani was kind of like a low-key MVP for a lot of things. Like, I think it was the last book where I said I felt like she was kind of the, the MVP with what she was helping with what Dalinar was trying to go through. You know, she was his rock there. Well, she takes front and center in this stage. I know that Vinley is the flashback character in this book, but this is very much Navani's book. I really feel like she is every bit front and center as any character in the first three books where... You had uh, what? You had Kaladin in book one. You had Shalana in book two, and you had Dalinar in book three. This one is very, very much. I know she's not the flashback character, but this one is very much Navani's book. So if you've been looking for that big Navani story, I think you're gonna like what you find here. Yeah, the uh, the science is cranked to eleven and stuff, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But a very, very good arc with Shalon. It is still dealing with her uh, uh, dissociative disorder and dealing with those multiple personalities, and it really has. I think, I wouldn't necessarily say a satisfying conclusion, because I don't think that that story's over, but there is a closing of one arc that started, I believe, way back in Words of Radiance. So I, you're looking for those kind of things to be closed off, but still leave it open for what's to come. I think you're going to get that here. This definitely feels like it is setting the stage for book number five, and it closes off a lot of those questions that we had with Shalon. One of my complaints in Oathbringer was that I said I felt like Sanderson overpowered his characters too fast. I mean, like they could fly, they could get stabbed in the heart. I was like, oh, oh Stormline, fine. You know, and I said I felt like he needed to find a way to depower them, but not to be like a cheat code, not feel cheap. And he does that here. I like what he does. He does a mechanic here that actually kind of levels the playing field with the fused and the radiance. And it's, it's, it's quality stuff. I like it. It actually goes back to the basics here uh, and a big part with Kaladin's story in learning how we deal with these things more on a more level playing ground or maybe at a disadvantage. It's, uh, it's really, really well crafted. I like what he did with it because again, that was something I was worried about. I was afraid it was going to be like a, a wheel of time where you're like, yeah, well, this dude's the baddest man in the land. How's he going to be stopped? Where I was never really worried. And I thought that the, you know, the, the climax was just like, hey, okay, well, I know who's going to win. With here, I feel like it has kind of leveled the playing field again. Anything, Brandon Sanderson, you've always got to have a real, real deep dive into investiture. And he continues to do that here. You continue to learn so much more. If you guys are interested in all kinds of different light, you're going to get it in this book. Because like I said, the science in here is deep. It is very, very deep. And he continues to really not be scared, not hold your hand. And he will dive headfirst into explaining some of this stuff. And you really got to put your thinking cap on more than once to be like, okay, wait, wait, what, now what's going on? Because you will kind of feel like you're in science class a couple of times. So uh, I, I don't think necessarily that that is something to deter you as much as it is to challenge the reader a little bit. I don't think it's wrong to challenge your reader a little bit. So I definitely going to put that in a positive. He continues to focus on mental illness. Now, this is something I've touched on before, where in each one of these books, he's had something, not necessarily just about mental illness or something that can relate to the reader. Every one of these books, I have found something that I can put into uh, you know, my early life or even up to my present life. And he does that again in this book. There's one specific part. I urge you guys to watch that spoiler review, but there was something that really hit home on something that I deal with on a daily basis in my personal life. And it really 
it just completely devastated me at the same time made me feel amazing so i mean that's something again i think is what makes this series so special is he's always going to make these characters that feel so real because they have you know normal everyday problems that people face outside of just oh hey there's some dark god that wants to kill us all you know it's not just the weight of the world on their shoulders it's the things that they deal with in their personal life in their head and things that they can't control mentally so uh, if you like that stuff i think you're going to be right at home here he does not shy away from that and he continues to write some of the most well-written damaged characters i think i would say that i've ever seen he continues to excel at that at the highest order so props to him to continuing to do that and again i talked about the character development but look he does superb development for two bridge four characters and this is i never expect i mean look i thought okay relaine i thought relaine he had room to grow obviously relaine was going to be one that he had plans for what i never expected was for david do you guys remember david <laughs> yeah i had to think about but then book one, Dabba was a character that was injured and uh, basically everyone was like, I'll leave behind. And Kaladin was like, no. And he used his surgeon skills to save his life. And he actually comes back into play here. And he has a significant part that's actually very, very well written and has just hit you right in the feels with the story. It's so good. So I love my Bridge 4 group. So anytime he's able to continue to develop that, I mean, there is not a single throwaway character in Bridge 4 at this point. Not a single one. And that is just a testament to how well he writes this group. It's just, it's superb. I can't say anything less than what he does with Dabin and Relay in this book. Top notch. Bravo. Now, if you watched my uh, wish list video for this book, I said I felt like we needed to have a big character death. One that really mattered. One that hit us where it hurt. And look, there are some heart-wrenching moments in this, is what I'll say. Um, not going to say how many. Not going to say how it happens. I'm not going to say who it happens to, but just know that it hurt. There was one that happened and it did hurt and it will leave an imprint, I think, on the remainder of this arc for certain characters. But you know, also me, where I was like, hey, we need to have a big death in this book. And then when it happens, I'm like, no. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's a big one. There's a very big one. And it's, while it's beautifully written, it's just, it's one of those things you see coming. It's like standing in front of a moving car and not being able to jump out of the way. You know it's coming and you just can't do anything about it because you're frozen. And it, yeah, it's just so well written and it's just absolutely soul crushing, man. It really, really did hurt. And uh, you know, uh, I don't really know what more I can say without 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 spoiling stuff. But it yeah, it was it was it was important. It was impactful and it did what it needed. And uh, you know, it makes you hate um, a specific character so much more. Really does. So that's all I'll say there. Uh, look, there are a couple of monumental twists here. There's one in particular that happens towards the last like five percent of the book that just I would have never ever guessed. And I know that people are straight speculation and theory hounds about this series. I don't think anyone saw this coming. So it was completely unexpected. But when it, when it happened, you're like, that's actually genius. And I'm glad that the way it happened, because it means that a specific character is going to be hanging around longer in this series than I thought they were. So, yes, quite the twist. Again, guys, I urge you to watch those spoiler videos if you've read the book and you really want to know what I'm talking about there, because I get into it a, a lot more. And the last thing I think I'll say is that the interludes here, in previous books, I felt like, look, the interludes are okay. I never thought that they were integral to the story like they are in this one. I feel like these are very much just taking a breath. You're taking a breath between these big parts, and we're just kind of setting the stage, you know, while they're while they're doing a a wardrobe change backstage. You're kind of setting the stage, but where it just felt like it was just kind of building upon the Cosmere a lot in some of the earlier books. This one, they are absolutely integral in the story you're reading right now. So don't skip them. I've had. Obviously, most people that are Sanders fans are not going to skip anything he writes, but I've had a lot of people be like, do I need to read the interludes? Are they important? Yeah, in this one, they're important for sure. I mean, I don't think you should have skipped any of them, but I didn't jump on people who, who, who were like, okay, I didn't really like the interludes, so I kind of skipped a couple of them. This one, you got to read these interludes because they're very, very important, specifically Terra Vanja, and you need to make sure that you're paying attention. I think one of the big ones here, and this is just kind of depend on how much of the Cosmere you've read. There are numerous tie-ins to the Cosmere in this book, so much so that I said, Way back when I first started this channel, I said I felt like that, that 
what I liked about Stormlight is it felt like it was Brandon Sanderson's version of The Dark Tower by Stephen King in that it was the connective tissue that held the rest of his world together. This kind of confirms that. It really ties in all these other ties in Storm, uh, sorry, I started in Mistborn, it ties in Warbreaker, Elantris, you name it. If it's been in the Cosmere, he finds a way to kind of wrap it in here. And it just makes his universe feel even bigger now and feeling like almost kind of like the MCU kind of thing there where you like you can you could skip one and be okay but you know if you want all of the goodies and all of the tie-ins you want to understand all the references yeah maybe you should read them all so uh, I it's one of those things I don't feel like it's going to ruin this book for you if you haven't read those other things although I do think you need to read Warbreaker because I really think Warbreaker is basically like Stormlight 2.5 for me at least more so than Edge Dancer but uh, hey Lyft was good in this book by the way there I'll say that Lyft was good in this book but uh, yeah I definitely think you should read that one but again if you guys have read the entire Cosmere like I've done mostly this year I think you're going to find some things that make you be like oh man I can't believe they're tying that in so uh, there are some things here guys that are bad. Look, there, uh, and this is always going to be subjective. Uh, I know anytime you have criticism of a Sanderson book, people will start, you know, p torches and pitchforks and they're ready to fight. Uh, I, I do have some criticism of this. I think these are the least interesting flashbacks in the series so far. But to be fair, Kaladin, Shallan, and Dalinar all had really good flashbacks. Vinley's a character I'm never really able to get interested in. I feel like the flashbacks in this are a lot of regurgitation of stuff we already knew. Uh, if you're like me and you just never really found the singer culture very interesting, you might not get very much out of these. And I think that they're kind of paced wrong. You know, there's a, there's not a flashback until part three in this book, so it feels like they're really, really loaded in part three and four. And it kind of makes the pacing of the book struggle a little bit. A lot of parts where I'd be like, okay, things are really picking up, and then it'd be a flashback, and you'd be like, okay, I just completely hit the brakes on the momentum I was gathering. I felt like this was the real, for lack of a better word, I was never able to find a rhythm with this book. With a lot of times with a Stormlight book, I'll sit down, I'll knock out 100, 150 pages. I never was able to get into a rhythm with this book. Flashback chapters were always just like a big road bump that I just didn't feel like driving over at the moment. So uh, your mileage is going to vary on that. Same with the uh, science and the terminology. Yes, it is very good, but here's the thing, guys. It's not exactly riveting to read. So if you uh, haven't taken astrophysics and, and, and crazy science classes, <laughs> I think you might struggle a little bit with them. Not really so much as understanding as much as just not being entertained by them. But just know that it it is important. It will make sense later why it's so important. So you do need to pay attention. And I don't think that he's going to kind of back off on this stuff. But I felt like that was the only part of the Navani chapters I was just kind of like okay on. The rest of her chapters I think are awesome. Even her, especially her stuff with, uh, with Rabonio. As much as I say I appreciate his focus on mental illness and stuff, uh, I have heard a lot of people criticize it. And look, I'll be honest. There are times in this book where I feel like it might get a little too after school special about it. It might be a little too much. I really, really appreciate him wanting to shine light on these things. But what I've said about fiction worlds is I like to be in a fiction world. I don't, I don't like narrative or commentary. And I feel like he might have started to kind of lean a little bit too much into it. I will accept that criticism. Uh, there's a particular character where I really, really appreciate it, like I said, because uh, it was something that related to my life and I really understood it. And it really, it, it did it did hit some feels for him because of that. But I, I do think it might have been just a little too much in this book. But again, it's nothing that's going to ruin anything for you. It just it, For some, it's a major gripe. For me, it's a minor gripe. It wasn't anything that really dragged it down. But there was some stuff where it was like, look, we've already done this stuff with a specific character. Are we really going to do it again? And it... it, it, it I liked it, don't get me wrong, but I can. here's the thing, I can justify people listening to that as a criticism. Let's talk about length of this book here. I really feel like it can be bloated sometimes. I it, There's a lot of times where it almost feels like, and I know that Sanderson isn't that guy, but it almost feels like, well, Oathbringer was this many pages, so I got to make sure this one's just as long, and it feels like maybe we're just padding our word count sometimes. Like I said, I already felt like, and I think that's just because I felt like the flashback stuff was a lot of information we already got, and I feel like we're getting a lot of it again. That, again, is going to depend on you. To me, yeah, this story could have been at least 300 pages shorter, and I'd have been just as happy, I think, but... If you're really into the singers, I think you'll be fine with it. But it, look, part three in this book, part three is the worst part of any Stormlight book for me so far. Yes, even over Oathbringer, 
Part 4. I would read Oathbringer Part 4 three times before I would read Part 3 of this book again. That's how much I really struggled through that. Uh, thankfully, 1, 2, and 5 are amazing. I love those. 4, pretty good. Uh, just like, like I'll get into in a little bit. It feels like a little bit of more regurgitation. But uh, yeah, that's really kind of the biggest things, guys. Look, it had a very, very slow middle section. It was mostly because of those flashback chapters. And I really think it was just a structure thing. It was just paced wrong. I wish he'd have kind of started filling in those uh, those flashback chapters a little early so Part 3 wasn't just bogged down with them. Uh, but uh, that's really... Most of what I've got for my good and my bad stuff here. Let's talk about why you should read it. Look, if you've come this far on this journey, I don't see why you would stop now. If you're one of those people who liked kind of the shift in, in direction that Oathbringer started, you're going to be right at home with this. You're going to like this a lot. Uh, if you're one of those kind of people who are like, look, I love book one and two. Three didn't do it, do it much for me. You're, this is probably going to be your least favorite Stormlight book. I, I don't know. It's really going to depend on you. Uh, for me, I, 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 yeah, there was some stuff where I was like, that's not really what I wanted it to do. If you've been more curious about the singer's culture and things like that, you're going to have a good time. If you want to know more about how Stormlight and Voidlight and all those kind of things work, you're going to get your answers here. If you've been waiting for him to connect his series to the other series in the Cosmere, this is going to be the book for you. I think you're going to have a great time with it. And it's uh, one of those things where you see so many people that are saying this is their favorite Stormlight book. And then you got the other people who are like, ah, this isn't quite what I was hoping for. And then you got the other people who are kind of in the middle. They're like, ah, it was kind of a setup book for book five, so I'm okay with that. Yes, I fall in that category where, look, this is my least favorite Stormlight book. But what I've been telling people is the worst Stormlight book is better than most series' best book, okay? There was a big section of this that didn't really hit for me, but the stuff that did hit, all the way. There's some big, big moments in this book that really made me like shout out loud that I was really happy to see happen. One big thing is I kind of feel some regurgitation here. I feel like I liked this story better the first time Brandon Sanderson wrote it. Back then it was called The Gathering Storm and the Towers of Midnight. Uh, Wheel of Time fans will know what I mean when I talk about the, uh, the occupation and when I talk about the trial. They'll understand, huh, yeah, it does sound really familiar. That's why. That's all I could think about during those plot points in this book. So there are some things I'm like, yeah, I feel like you did that better when you wrote it last time. But again, it's way more positives than negatives, guys. Look, I love what he did with Dalinar in this book. I love what he did with Teravangian in this book and Kaladin and, of course, Navani. I, I like the Shallan stuff, not as much as, like say, like a Words of Radiance or something, but I, I really like that. I do wish Adolin had a little bit bigger of a part than he does, but again... I think we're going to get our big moments in book five. I'm just not quite. I know each book's going to be, you know, a different rated order. And this one was Will Shapers. Uh, it's just okay to me. It's not an order that I find very interesting. However, book five is going to focus on Zeth's flashbacks and the Skybreakers order. And that's something I'm very, very interested to see. And obviously, it's going to be the end of this uh, five book arc here. So I'm very excited. Look, uh, yeah, I just was never really into Vinley or the Will Shapers. And I think that's what kind of dragged it down for me. But again, when you put on the review goggles for something like this, you're going to nitpick and you're going to talk about things that you didn't really like. I liked way more in this book than I disliked. And I think you probably will too. Like I said, there's, there's a lot of people out there that are like, you know, 11 out of 10, the best Stormlight book ever. And look, I'm glad those people got exactly what they were looking for. Me, hmm, wasn't quite the way I was hoping that it would go. But again, another fun trip through Roshar. I'm enjoying it. I can't wait for book five. I will be counting down just like everyone else. You know, I just I just had some uh, some some problems with this book, and I think it might be kind of like Oathbringer. You know, when I finished Oathbringer, I was kind of ho hum on it, and I, I didn't know how I felt about it. And then after some time passed, I started thinking about it. And I was like, you know, it's actually really, really, really great. So uh, I, with this one, I think maybe some time will pass. I'll feel maybe a little differently about some of those flashbacks and and, and things like that. And it'll maybe it'll it'll click a little more for me. But again, it's a very big recommend for me. Uh, I'm just a little more critical on it than I have been on some of the other Stormlight books. But again, those are some of my favorite books in all of fantasy. So the bar has been set very high by the Lord Ruler himself. So guys, that is the end of the Stormlight coverage for the year 2020. You know, we'll get back on it here, uh, obviously, when we get closer to this, but I don't think there'll be any shortage of Cosmere stuff going forward. Sanderson doesn't seem like he's going to stop being a robot and writing super, super fast here in the future, and we will cover it then. Guys, what did you think about Rhythm of War? If you want to talk about spoilers, please jump on the spoiler videos that I made. Let's try to keep it somewhat spoiler-free here if we can, but guys, I don't monitor those comments like that. If people want to put spoilers in there, 
Center. Kind of uh, advance at your own risk. But drop there and let me know what you thought, guys, and I will talk to you there.